Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Concord Carlisle Regional School Committee. I would like to call the Concord Carlisle Regional School Committee to order, and we're going to call to order by roll call because we have a member on Zoom. Anderson present. Booth present. Morano present. Patel present. Rainey present. Rankin present. Um, and I. I think Sharon's on too. Hold on. I think Sharon's on the Zoom. Okay. And I will call the Concord School Committee meeting to order. We're all here, so do we have to do it by a roll call? No. Mm -hmm. No. Great. Exact session meeting, yeah. Yeah, exact yeah. session we will. Yeah. Right, but we're not in there yet. Yes, so. This is just. This public meeting, meeting, you have to do a roll call vote to go into. Into exact session. session, yes. So at this point, we are going to adjourn into exec session. And so if I could ask a member to read the motion, and then we will roll call. Court. <laughs> I move that the Concord School Committee and the Concord Carlisle School Committee will enter into executive session under purpose seven of the open meeting law to comply with or act under the authority of any general or special law or federal grant and aid requirements, specifically NGL chapter 30A, section 22, regarding the review and approval of executive session materials. We consider the approval and release of executive session materials in Jan uh, February 2, 2021, February 9, 2021, February 23, 2021, March 2, 2021, March 9, 2021, March 16, 2021, March 30, 2021, April 13, 2021, April 27, 2021, May 11, 2021, May 18, 21, uh, 2021, May 25, 2021, June 1, 2021, June 8, 2021, July 7, 2021, July 12, 2021, and July 15, 2021. Under Purpose 3, under which these sessions were held, and Under Purpose 2, under which the March 2, 2021, March 9, 2021, March 16, 2021, March 30, 2021, April 27, 2021, May 11, 2021, May 18, 2021, May 25, 2021, June 1, 2021, and June 8, 2021 meetings were held and returned to open session. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Carrie. And roll call, please. Anderson, aye for both. Booth, aye for both committees. Morano, aye for both. Patel, aye for regional. Rainey, aye for both. Rankin, aye for both. Wood, aye for region. All right, and we will be back in a few minutes. And we're back. Let's go to follow up. Welcome back, everyone. We are gonna start our meeting now, and we're gonna start with our CCHS students. So I see Harry's on, and let's see. I see Zaria or Felicity. Yeah, Felicity can't make it tonight. Unfortunately, she had um, a course rehearsal, but we still have an update for you guys. Great. Uh, I'm not sure it's going to let me screen share, but we can just go through it more. It's a pretty good one. That's fine. I think we can screen share. Hold on one second. I think we have it. Yeah. Try it again, Harry. Oh, is it raining? I had to start the reading. It's oh, morning. Yeah. It's snowing. It's snowing? <laughs> okay. There is we it go. Now? Yep. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Do you want to get us started? Okay. Uh, the CC Theater has announced a spring musical. It's the prom. Uh, and auditions start the week of February 26th. So, end of February. I just start, and I think we're all pretty excited, right? Because I feel like our mm -hmm. school is really good at putting on productions, so I'm really excited about that. Yeah, uh, and then it's also just been a busy few, busy few weeks, really, for the women's sports team. So tonight we have girls basketball and also the swimming, and then tomorrow we have um, one of our varsity track and field meets at New Mount, so that's very exciting. Uh, students have been busy with midterm tests and project prep. I know in my a lot of my classes we've started doing a lot of 
just stuck in class getting ready for our getting ready for next week, which is our midterms and some finals for some mm-hmm. like only one semester classes. But it's just getting a little bit stressful. But I think we're all gonna power through it. <laughs> yes. Um, and then last week, one of the teachers of the anatomy science lecture took her class to the back bay. There's a museum of human anatomy there. Um, I have a lot of friends who take that class. They all said they really enjoyed it. On Friday, there was um, there was a mental health assembly, and for a sophomore convening, and we all really enjoyed it. We were, we thought it was very informative, and it was just a very good experience overall. And yeah, that was basically our take. Yeah, not too much going on this week. People are kind of just keeping their heads down here for midterms. They're just studying all week and doing all their homework. <laughs> Yeah. That anatomy um, field trip was on Instagram. It was it was mm-hmm. yeah. looked cool. It's wild in there. Great. Well, thank you so much for the update. It's a great update as usual. We'll look forward to your next one. You can feel free to stay with us, or if anything's on your mind, you know how to find us. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. All right. And with that, we will move to the public comment section of our meeting. And we will start with public comment in the room and we'll go back and forth between the room and online. So if you have a public comment, if you're in the room, if you have a blue sheet, you can bring it to me. And if you are online, um, you can use the raise hand feature. You will have three minutes. And I think I need to hear the microphone for you. Is there one right there? Great. Okay. Gail Heyer, you're up first. Does this work? It does actually work online. We can hear you. Yep. (laughs) Um, I'm Gail Heyer. Um, I live on Nancy Road here in Concord, and I have a middle schooler. I'd like to comment tonight on the Solar Implementation Task Force proposal to expand solar energy by using the CCHS campus. I understand from reading the select board, minute materi- select board meeting materials that the task force recommends ground-mounted solar across from the BD Center, as well as roof-mounted Solid. panels. Um, First, I think that the school should be deciding how to use its land for the students' benefit. The school committee should evaluate these proposals first before town meeting makes any decisions about school property. Second, current open space is limited on the campus and has possibilities that more directly benefit the students. I wonder if the skate park could stay if that area is converted to solar panels. Open spaces can be used for outdoor classrooms, for sledding, student projects such as wildflower meadows, parking lots, and future buildings and future athletic facilities. If land is converted to solar use, it will be unavailable for decades, if not forever. Third, solar panels and inverters can interfere with cell signals and Wi-Fi connectivity. This can be caused by physical obstructions or by electromagnetic interference. As long as there are concerns about cell service, in the building, putting solar panels, especially on the roof, would be risky. Designing a system that avoids signal interference requires careful engineering and planning. I think it's inappropriate for town meeting to vote on solar panels at the high school unless and until much more is known about this proposed solar installation. I'm not sure what the committee can do about it, but I just wanted to share my views. I think it's important to really look at this carefully before town meeting you know, takes up this idea without really careful consideration. Thanks. Thank you. All right, do we have anyone online? Seeing no one else in the room, we are gonna move on. Thank you. All right, next up we have the consent agenda. And does anyone wanna remove anything from the consent agenda? How do we address the change to the 1114 minutes? That was they were emailed to us, so yep. So as as they emailed. as emailed, okay. And that was the November fourteenth minutes. Everyone okay. has that change from Carrie Reagan. Okay, so with that, I'd entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. So, so moved. You have a second. Second. Any discussion? Roll call. Anderson, I for both. Who's I for both? Rano, I for both. Patel, I for region. Rainy, I for both. Rankin, I for both. Wait, back to meeting. Thank you. All right, and with that, we'll move on to correspondence. Okay. 
Um, after our January 19th meeting, we received four pieces of correspondence um, asking about capacity numbers at the middle school, um, talking about cell phone service at the high school, even though it came to Concord, uh, another one about the middle school capacity, and then uh, something about a flight in Hong Kong. Interesting. Okay. And at the region, we had oh, so one, two, three, four, five pieces of correspondence. Three were regarding the cell tower or RF frequency. We had um, information shared from the Solar Task Force. And then we had an inquiry about our school calendar from um, a resident from Lexington. And that's it. All right. And with that, um, I will we'll do the superintendents, chairs, and liaisons update. And we're going to just ask that if you can just be really brief, and only if it's something really pressing, only with the weather tonight, we want to try and you know move things on a little bit because we have a very lengthy agenda. So why don't we start, and then we'll move to you. Yeah. Okay. The only thing that um, I had to report on was just an awesome League of Women Voters event mm -hmm. on Friday at the library. And Lori and Kristen and Katie Stahl was there. And let's see, Andrew, Andrew. and Christine Angel. Johnson and Angel. And they did an unbelievable um, just update like post COVID, what do schools look like right now? Where are we at? The league was very supportive of the district. I mean, really had nothing but positive things to say. Alex and I were in attendance. I think there were 30 odd people in the room and an additional almost 30 on 30 Zoom. Online. So. It was a pretty well attended event. Yeah, but really great presentation. And I think that, you know, it was great to just see administrators up there and just to really hear from them about what school life has been like post pandemic. Um, and I think for people at the league, and there were a few parents in the audience, but mostly, you know, members of the league, they were just thrilled to hear about what's really happening, you know, on the ground in our school. So it was really great. So thank you for that. And and it was recorded, recorded. And I think that the league was going to get it out Push to it the out. public. Yep. Yep, and then I think that's it because I think the rest of um, any updates will really come tonight for our agenda. Did you have anything? No. Anyone else have any pressing updates before Lori goes? Nope. Okay. Over to you, Lori. Yeah. I just wanted to highlight two events. One was my opportunity to shadow a high school student last week, and just immerse myself in classrooms with teachers and students, and what a fantastic day that was. Um, and then the second would be the visit yesterday from our uh, U.S. Rep, Lori Trahan, at the shelter. Um, she was able to come and hear from Mock and a number of other efforts that have gone on there and really hear the big picture, spend some time with the children in the play space and hear about the schools and the preschool work and the volunteers that are working there and uh, really I think her words were take, you know, what they're talking about in D.C. and really see it in a real life environment of it's all about the people. And um, so it was a great it was a great opportunity and a great visit with her. And uh, I think she left feeling really informed in a new way. Sort of adjacent to that, I I don't know um, the coat and like winter <laughs> drive. Is that complete? I think it is for the most part. Um, so last Thursday, we realized somehow through the cracks had slipped snow gear for the children at the shelter. And it came up because our family coordinator was chatting with the families and they're all excited about the weather forecast. And then she's asking how if they have snow pants and they don't know what she's talking about. So I can't say enough about this community's response to a quick all call for donations. Um, we were really, really uh, overwhelmed by them. We were able to get to them, them to the shelter over the weekend, and the children wore them at Willard yesterday, they wore them at the preschool, in the volunteer, this was the best, I think, in the play space at the shelter yesterday while 
the representative was there, two of the preschoolers had just gotten their things and they loved them so much they refused to take them off. <laughs> so they, been hot. <laughs> you, you, you would think they were hot, but it didn't appear to bother them. Um, cutting with mittens on is a new skill we're practicing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it sounds like it's been a really fun few days for them. Many had not seen snow, um, given their timing of arrival in the US from somewhere south. So it's just a, been a great fun few days in this community. You know, just can't say enough with the outpouring of generosity in less than 24 hours. It's great. Yeah. It's great. Thank you so much for that. And that drive really, I mean, it, it went off quickly. Like yeah. it, I put it out Thursday night and said, please drop it off by noon on Friday. And people did. <laughs> and I think you had like two tables stocked oh, with. We had four by the four. time we okay. were done. So a lot yeah. of. So anything that doesn't get used there, which a lot of it will, um, either is going to go to the other shelters locally or they're starting a consignment, a free consignment space at one of the local churches. And that'll be a spot for shelter and any other families in the community to go um, shop for what they need in consignment. So Great. It'll all be well used. All right. Thank you. All right, and with that, we will move on to our discussion items. And first off, we are thrilled to have our co-principals of CCHS, Brian Miller and Katie Stahl. Um, we're just so grateful to have you in person with us to hear about how things are going at the high school. And just as a reminder to anyone that might be listening at home, Brian and Katie took over as our co-principals. They, they were co-principals last year and they continued on this year and we've really just enjoyed watching everything that's been happening at the high school. So, so much positive has come out of that high school. So we're looking forward to hearing what you want to tell us. Thank you. Great. Thanks everybody for having us. Um, so we'll just talk a little bit and then at the end we have just a few slides uh, with some visuals that might help as well. So, um, you know, the roles, it's a unique role, right? There's, if you look around, there's not many places that have a co-principalship but it really allows us to move forward initiatives in a more efficient way. Like a perfect example would be when you were just talking about the League of Women Voters, right? Like Katie was there and they really wanted the high school principal there. And I was on a Zoom with a professional development person talking about teaching while white and this professional development we're going to do in the DEIB space with our teachers. And they wouldn't have done that without a principal there. And we were doing both exactly simultaneously. Um, we also feel like it really models collaboration and working together for faculty and students, right? That's what we expect teach our teachers and kids um, to do. And we're asking them to work on teams and we're hoping that we are leading that by example. And um, the, what I always say is I feel like I always have a thought partner. I, you know, we feel like um, shared decisions make better decisions and you know, the, our administrative team at school is a really great team. And Darius and Megan will talk about it. They know 99.9% .9 of the things, but maybe there's that 1.1% that we can't always share. But Katie and I always know it, and we're always able to talk and think about it, and that uh, really helps us. Yeah. Um, so just a little bit about us and our characteristics. Obviously, we had a previous working relationship as co-principals, um, working with Mike, our former principal. Um, and as much as we love the model, um, neither of us actually believe that like you could do this with just anyone. Um, we are very complimentary of each other. Um, we're very collaborative by nature and we have different skill sets. They're complementary to each other, but they're different. Um, and that really seems to work really well for our community and for us. Um, Brian was a physics teacher. I was a special educator and an English teacher. We have different brains. Brian's very logistical, I'm not. Um, so there's just things that, um, that work with, with our teamwork. Um, we have our own areas of responsibility, um, but there's also many areas where we collaborate together. We're gonna talk a little bit about a lot of the initiatives we're doing um, this year at CCHS and all of those we're working on together through our leadership team model. Um, another thing is, is that we are in frequent communication. We talk many times a day, we text a thousand times a day. Um, so if you are in contact with one of us, you're really in contact with both of us because we share every, we really do share everything with each other. There's been 
very few times, like, which is really impressive where it's been like, oh, we didn't, yeah. you know, we weren't on the same page about something or we forgot to tell each other something. Um, so that's just real, that really works for us. Sometimes I feel like I talk to Brian more than I talk to my husband and yeah. <laughs> he with his partner. Um, and so I think lastly is that we also have um, shared values and vision for where we want the school to go and how we lead. Um, we try very much so to lead with a very student-centered perspective always and really putting students at the forefront of our decision making. Um, and that is not always hard to find, believe it or not, in, uh, in leaders, um, in my experience. And so that is something that has been really um, important to me and I think important to us and why we work so well together as co-principals. And I would just like to say um, thank you to Dr. Hunter because we know that this is an unconventional model um, and one that you know we definitely um, feel very lucky to be in and we are so happy for this opportunity and feel like it's really serving the community well. Okay. So a little bit about sort of where we are in our structure is, um, so we have two, um, we added an administrator at the high school. So we have two assistant principals this year um, and they're just incredible. And we'll talk about them in a second. But when we were both assistant principals, it sort of felt a little bit like we were a jack of all trades and a master of none. So when we were, um, thinking about how do we want to re redesign and we had this amazing opportunity to just think about it for a little bit of a decent amount of time, you know, that's sort of, we landed on this idea that we have an assistant principal of student life, who's Megan Maines, and we have an assistant principal of teaching and learning, who's uh, Dr. Darius Green. And I think that that's helped everybody. I think faculty knows where to turn when they have a question or a challenge and it has allowed them to feel more supported. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about Meg. So Meg is our assistant principal of student life, like I said. I mean, she just has amazing connections with kids. I mean, the number of kids she knows at CC in the first semester of working there is remarkable. I mean, we it's not, in, we actually don't even joke. She's honestly on the third and fourth floor far more than she's ever in her office, right? If you wanna go see her, if we wanna see her, we walk upstairs. Right, it's not, that's just where she's always there, whether that's in a breakout space. And you know, I think that certainly allows great student connections, but it also allows to keep the small things small, mm -hmm. right? Whether it's kids who are walking in the hallway that maybe need to get back to be uh, shuffled back to class, or, you know, a teacher who needs help with, who needs help with something. Um, it's, been, it's been really good. But I also want to point out, while we have these roles of Megan, Meg doing students, and Katie will talk a little bit about Darius doing um, faculty. Like, we're all doing a little bit behind the scenes as well, right? Like, Meg is doing some incredible work with curriculum, particularly in Rivers. She has a lot of experience with that experiential learning piece. So, well, like, outwardly, certainly, that's her role as student life. Um, it's not the only It's not the only thing she's doing. doing and and vice versa. same time, like, when any, like, a big student thing comes up, we're all gonna do it. We're all there to help. Yeah, and so one thing I will say is, it is really impressive. Meg is really upstairs all day. I mean, she's upstairs or she's in the cab, she's out and about, and we felt like that was really important, especially last year when it was just the two of us. We couldn't be out student facing as much as we very much wanted to be because there were so, there's so many other things that happened throughout the day. Um, so that's been, that's been great for our community, great for teachers. I think they feel supported with that and great for students because um, they know, you know, they like to test boundaries and they know that Ms. Not Mays our kids. Is, no, not our kids, but <laughs> you know, they, they know that people are around and supervising and watching and also there to support. And so that's been great. Um, so Dr. Green is our assistant principal of teaching and learning. Um, he, that has been wonderful. Um, as many of you all, all know, we have our department chair structure. Um, and so we meet with our department chairs weekly um, to really push the work forward of um, all of our initiatives, which we will talk about. But Darius has been amazing because again, just like we really wanna be out in the hallways and 
you know, supervising students, we also really always want to be in classrooms. And that was something that was really difficult for us to do when it was just the two of us or even three of us. Um, so having Darius have a really specific focused lens on teaching and learning and curriculum and instruction and working with each department to know exactly what their department goals are or what they're working on, um, I think has been really, really great for the school. Um, in some ways, it's like a coaching model. He'll go with department chairs and, you know, calibrate around what's happening in a classroom. You know, what did you see? This is what I saw. And just really have that kind of supportive approach with the department chairs so that they can then have, um, you know, maybe a different lens when they go in next time on their own. Um, and he also is very helpful with students. He's super student centered. The kids love him and he is always, um, you know, there to support us with student challenges um, if need be. So it's been really great. So um, we'll talk a little bit about what we've been able to do as a result of having this full team. So most of our work is done with our leadership team. So Kristen sits on that. And just to give you an idea, that's all of the department heads. It's our librarian, tech specialist, our wellness coordinator, Meco, Meco director. director, Andrew, so DEIB director. I think that's about it. Like it's about 20 group. people or yeah. so. And really, this is the this is how we do most of our work. And as I said, having four people has allowed us to um, uh, move things forward. So I'm going to share. And. I think we're really proud of how much we've been able to do in such a short time starting last year and then really even more so continued this year with a full team with two assistant principals. Um, it's time. It's been time and we've been ready <laughs> and wanting to jump into this work and it finally feels like we've been able to really get there. Um, so what we shared up on the screen is the space framework, which is a framework that is used um, it's from Challenge Success, which is one of our partners. Um, one little example is tonight when, yeah. or earlier today when we were looking at this and kind of planning um, who is gonna talk about what, we looked at this and I said to Brian, well, I think there's gonna be some things that you're probably more suited to talk about and some things that I'm more suited. So immediately we jumped in and automatically it was, was like, like okay he, i'll start with s he's like i'll start with s i'm like well i've got p and i've got a it's just like we kind of laughed about it because we were just like a lot was easy okay we're done we can move on to whatever else we need to be doing right now um so so this is the space um framework like i said and so our three goals that we're working on this year with challenge success um is student overload, lack of resilience and coping skills, and building a positive school culture. So those are the three overarching goals that we are working on with our Challenge Success Consultant and with our Challenge Success Team, which is made up of leadership team. And we were finally able to add students back into it post-COVID. Yeah. So that's been really great um, to have the student voice. <clears throat> So what we'll do is we're going to talk about the various initiatives that we're working on, as we said, sort of thinking as a space framework, as a container for it all. So we're working on a new schedule. We implemented a new schedule this year, and it's, it's great. Like, it's really working well. I mean, you hear kids and teachers saying, like, oh, you, I can't miss flex. Like, I love flex. Like, it's too, like, and it's just been... Life-changing feels cliche, but it really has been amazing mm -hmm. to be able to have a space. You know, so along with that, we're working with, so in not just the new schedule, but the flex is the biggest change from it. And I think that one of the pieces that having two of us has allowed is really to dive into this like fiscal responsibility and really have a good handle on it. No knock to anybody who's done it before us. It's just that we have more capacity to do it. Yep. So. That's S. And do you mind if we jump in at any point please. with like no, questions or comments oh, yeah, so yeah. to keep it like conversational? Absolutely. I assumed 
people okay. will, so please do. Well, I'm gonna jump in and say, do. you know, in terms of flex blocks, I mean, that is the feedback from every student that you talk to. They are really angry when they miss a flex block. Yes. And, and remember how angry they were last yeah. spring when they didn't know what it was. They didn't know what it was. Yeah. I mean, they really, like, it's like, I, I can't get extra help. I have a math test and, you know, it's a half day and there's no flex block. So the feedback out there from the student side is very positive. Yeah. And from the parent side, I mean, that is just, it, it's unbelievable of this, you know, real, positive movement just in a matter of you know four months i mean yeah. you think about that it's amazing if yeah. it's something that challenge success says they say that really there's it's one of the only things that affects every person that works in that building mm -hmm. right from the custodians to the cafeteria workers to the teachers to us right like we all that's the, the schedule is sort of this unifying thing and to just create the time and space i feel like it's just released a little bit of pressure yeah. Mm -hmm. For kids and teachers. Yeah, I was going to say, I think teachers would agree with everything you just said. I think that they also feel that it's just been, it's been a game changer for them. They can, you know, connect with students in a way that maybe they haven't been able to before by offering something different, or they can connect with their students on, you know, curriculum or whatever it is that they feel that their students need. And I think that just having that space in our schedule twice a week has been, mm -hmm. has been fantastic. Um, okay. okay, so the next, so the P is the pedagogy that um, engages. And so we're doing a lot around, um, you know, looking at teaching and learning, which we've been so ready and excited to do for the last three years. Um, so just a quick overview of some of the things that we're doing. We're working with Deeper Learning, um, which is an organization um, out of Harvard. So we're working with somebody from Deeper Learning with their leadership team and um, thinking about how to really create authentic and deeper learning experiences for students that engages that engages them in a way that um, that maybe they haven't been before and so we're really looking at how to create outcomes for them where they're really engaging in critical thinking and different types of learning experiences um, Another thing that we're working on is we're partnering with um, the landmark school so we, um, partnered with Landmark for our lab program, which is um, one of our language ba our language based program for students with disabilities. But we're trying to push that work further and think about um, what common instructional practices are just really good practices for all teachers to have, so that students can um, go from classroom to classroom and have those practices and practices and skills kind of transfer from one class to the next instead of having things look very different from one class to the next. So we are um, starting to think about what that will look like um, for ninth graders and working with um, Landmark with a focus on our ninth grade academy. Um, we're hoping to bring quarter five back next year. Well, we are bringing quarter five back next year. And so just really, that's something that I'm excited about because I've heard about it for five years, but I've never experienced it. And we have a lot of new educators in our school um, who are also very excited um, to engage in that next year. And then obviously our Rivers and Revolutions program is something that you all know about. It's been part of our community for a long time, um, but it had a little bit of a, um, a reboot this year with some of the faculty. We had some um, former faculty members come back to Rivers and really kind of um, just revamp it a little bit, which has been really great. And um, the students have had a great, a great uh, semester this yeah. semester that's coming to a close soon. Okay, there. Any questions on this? So A is alternative and authentic assessment. So data wise, we've had a real, with a fourth administrator, we've really been able to um, use data and make data driven decisions. So all of our leadership team during the first quarter completed the data wise course out of Harvard, which has um, really, it's been great. You know, we're looking at data in a new way in a, you know, and in a way that I don't, I don't remember us ever doing at CCHS. Mm. Um, kudos to Florence and Kristen and all of these folks who are doing the seal of biliteracy. Um, you know, we can't take tons of credit for it, but it is happening and it's great. Um, people know what this is. Yes. Okay. okay. You can you can give maybe like a very high level. Sure, it's um, a seal that will go on kids' diplomas for students who who demonstrate um, that they're biliterate, that they 
English and their home language. So they'll take a test in, in their language and yeah. then um, they will get a seal on their diploma yeah. that will distinguish them from other students. Yeah, and I want to be clear, it's not, sorry, I misspoke. It's not just a language that they might have natively spoke at home, it's also a language that they could have learned like through school, Concord school. Public School. And it's different from the global literacy. Do you still do that? Yeah, you that's more that about the um, community, like, service community service based. and service. Okay. Yeah. And then the last thing we're starting to look at um, is grading for equity and looking at Joe Feldman's book and how does grading, and we're really dipping our toe into this one right now, but we're just getting started in what right grades sort of are, what should go into a grade? What does a grade mean? How should grades be calculated on all of these pieces? Um, some of us are doing a PD path through Kristen and all of at the middle school, so we're getting started with that one as well. I, I should say under those three, all of them are uh, important parts of the DEIB plan. Yeah, that's, that's where they all come from. Mm -hmm. yes. Right, and MTSS, I mean, the data-wise mm -hmm. is what, you know, we, we're looking at, um, you know, we're using universal screeners for um, academics and social emotional learning, um, looking at our DCAP closer and just thinking about that, so. Um, so this one has a lot. This one has a lot and I'm gonna go quick. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time, but it, you can look at it and just see. So this is climate of care. Um, so we just put all of the things that we feel relate to climate of care that we are, who we are partnering with or working on. So as you all know, we have a, uh, a wellness coordinator this year because we felt that it was really important to have one person in the building whose sole purpose it was to come in and look at the health and wellness of faculty and students every day. Um, because as you all know, um, mental health is something that our students have struggled with before COVID and continue to struggle with post-COVID. Um, and so that's something that we know that we really need to commit to and really support. Um, so we have our new wellness coordinator and along with that, we have partnered with the Jed Foundation um, and Cartwheel around mental health supports. Cartwheel, as you know, is incredible. Students are guaranteed to see a clinician within seven to 10 days of the whole process starting and really get um, the, a game changer. the support that they need. There were tons of wait lists um, before this for us. And um, you know, this, is, this has definitely, this has been a game changer for sure. Um, we are doing a lot of work with um, restorative pa restorative justice or um, restorative pathways to restorative communities. Um, we've tweaked some of our MECO supports, um, which has been amazing for our MECO students. And we also are looking at some of our special education programming um, and thinking about how we can really improve some of um, those supports to really meet the needs of our students. And lastly, uh, Ninth Grade Academy. We're in our, did I say, was it, it's fourth, our fourth yeah. year um, of Ninth Grade Academy and it feels really good to really be kind of now pushing that work even further. Um, the structure's there, the teams are there, the kid talk is there, and now we can kind of really start to focus on skills and some of the interdisciplinary instruction and things that we wanna do. And the last piece is e-education for everyone. So we're continuing our work with NEASC. Uh, Kristen said, obviously, DEIB is huge. This learn, grow, and evolve, that's, that's Kristen's logo. So we took it right we from her. We stole it. Right, but we're continuing work with professional development, whether that be department-based or school-wide. Um, we're excited to bring some folks from Teaching While White. Uh, they actually came out of Weston there. That's what we're doing our um, the morning of our PD day in January. So it's um, helping teachers, it's a part of our DEIB work. And the last graphic is, um, you know, we'll be talking, we're coming back in February, so hope you're excited to see us again. But um, we'll be talking more about multiple paths to success, but that's again something we're working on that all kids feel um, like they have a home and all kids feel like they have a plan leaving CC, whether that is college or something else. What's Teaching Well White? What's, what's that? Yeah, so it's a professional development um, organization. They actually started out of, I believe, West, mm -hmm. Weston. And the people, the women who started are out of Weston. And it's how, so it's not a 
no one's stunned by this. The majority, a lot of our teachers at the high school are white. And so how do teachers who are white feel comfortable having discussions about race? How do they make all students have a sense of belonging? How do they make all students feel connected in their classroom, regardless of their race? Any other questions about any of those? I know that was a lot. Or about anything we talked about before oh, we went through all the initiatives. So how you measure your success? You, have a big, you said you have a lot of data. Yep. And there's a lot of, comp a lot of, a lot of components. So maybe when you come back in February, you can just show us an example or two of how you're saying we identified the problem with some of the data or whatever, you know, something that needs to be done. Sure thing. And then what you would do then and then what you say about the data and then we can look at whether, you know, and what, you know, some things are going to be more successful than others. Right, yeah. right, yeah. Um, and some, you could get shocked by some of these, how, like, a little, this would work, results in this and this. Absolutely. So, yeah, that would be really exciting. Sure. Yeah, that would be great. I'd love to share individual stories. <laughs> I want to thank you for the presentation. Um, I think it's uh, no surprise that most of the benefits accrue on the psychosocial part of high school life right now, but to Cynthia's point, when this uh, moves forward, we're going to see more, more quantitative uh, outcomes as well, which we'll want to hear more about, I think, or speaking for myself. Um, when we speak to the uh, many partnerships we have, these are in fact contractual relationships we have with outside providers for the most part. If you had to pick one or two or three of these uh, resources that we've brought in that you want to see really embedded in our culture so that we don't import the resource mm -hmm. but we in fact become the resource. Mm -hmm by embedding these values and these skills, what, what one or two or three would you, would you put on the top of your list? It's not a, I'm not asking you to commit to yeah. achieving this, but rather just to get a sense of your, your, your thinking about it. I, great question. It is a great question. And I mean, so many of, there's so many there that are so important. I think, um, I think a lot of it does start with data and really looking at the data piece to identify what are the areas that we need to grow in and what is what is the story as to what's happening so i think you know the the data wise and the data piece is really important um as something to really think about as and i you know to i to identify the the challenges in terms of academics i think really thinking about um instruction with deeper learning and the in the skills with landmark is something that i think will reach all students and i think that's really important too mm -hmm. because i think that there's always room for growth um, with instruction and instructional practices of all teachers whether they be first year teachers or 20 year teachers and i think that um, our students deserve to have you know innovative and engaging ways to learn and so i think that's something that for me at least I would say is yeah, really important. I actually totally agree with you. I don't I could echo I could say again what she said, but I there's no need. <laughs> I agree. My colleagues know that uh, I prefer us not to stop at uh, uh, getting inspiration or looking for comparative data from our ten peer schools, but mm -hmm. rather a much wider perspective. And I think the partnerships that you've brought in allow you to have those conduits uh, and bring bring the world in for ideas and inspiration that yeah. might yeah. be very challenging for us, but could at the same time be very exciting for us. They're totally yeah. right, like challenge success. I had a call with a school in California the other day about how are you doing this X, Y, or Z, right? And that that's just because of the network that our challenge success mm -hmm. coach and said, oh, she's also coach of that school. And she said, oh, here, you two connect. And we had a Zoom yeah. and it was fruitful for both ends. I think that's true also for the administrators that we brought in to be on our team. I think Meg and Darius have, yeah. you know, they have different experience in different types of schools that has been really, you know, they're so both really um, seasoned. seasoned and, you know, the data piece alone, they both have a ton of experience yeah. with how to look at data, how to use data. And I think that that's been really beneficial for our entire 
you know, yeah. I mean, Darius and will continue the to be. We did yeah. DataWise because of Darius. It was like, yeah. I've done this at other schools and it's just this eight week online course and we all did it and it was great. Excellent. Let's um, ask so, some of your initiatives span probably the two most important things moving forward for the high school. One we mentioned so many times, but you have like 10 initiatives to address mental health yeah. and wellness. So that's an overarching, but there's Cartwheel, Pierce Hollis, Jed Foundation, Christina's work, you know, and on and on. And the other one is our work on uh, the sense of belonging, um, because while probably, depending on the measure, 85% of our kids feel something like that, very uh, at home, we have historically marginalized population that doesn't. And so identifying them and creating the structures, uh, curriculum, people, spaces that make them feel um, more of a sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. You again have like 10 initiatives in that area as well. Yeah. Alexa. Um, so for me, you know, I, I have found this year and last year the the wellness of our kids to be of particular urgency. I think there's broad consensus that, so I'm grateful to hear that two of your goals were were very much in line with that. You talked about um, the work with Chelm's success um, in, de in, in developing more resilience with our students. I think that's an extraordinary goal. Um, and then I'll paraphrase it as saying, you know, the increase of school spirit. I think mm -hmm. um, we saw a total, um, you know, a, a erasure of both resilience in kids and, and, and a sense of community and belonging. Um, and to everyone's point about data, and I think this will be complicated and it's almost, um, I'm wondering as you talk about, particularly um, you gave sort of anecdotes about Megan Maines, um, being sort of this omnipresent force. And it's funny because I am obviously not in the schools, I am not on the third floor, um, but I am you know, out and about in the community and, and I thought it was, and you mentioned this, Katie, um, Darius was ironically, and he's very hard to miss, he's a very large man and yeah. you see him everywhere. Darius was everywhere, um, particularly on the athletic fields and, and sort of out in the community. So. Um, you know, one of the things I think that we talk about in the Youth Risk Behavior Survey and one um, data point that always stood out to me, and I'm wondering if when you talk about data, if you'll see through lines um, over the years coming in the Youth Risk Behavior Survey that we can kind of bring back to these efforts that you're doing. Um, I, you, you, there's, there's, a, there's a question I believe that's been in that survey for years that's called, that, um, that identifies like a, a trusted adult. Yeah. Um, and I think, I don't remember how we fared on that, it, truthfully, I don't remember, but, um, and, and I think, you know, if, if that's something I would be curious for us to continue to look at, because it wouldn't even just be Meg and Darius, I think, and I did, this was something I didn't think of before, but when you also spoke about the flex blocks and the ability to connect with a teacher that you don't have, so, you know, I, you know, your kid doesn't take whatever class or they never have Mr. So-and-so, but they might connect with them on a different way. So that is something um, as we continue to talk that I would like to see to, in, in, again, in an effort to quantify the efforts we're doing, thinking about when we look at those surveys, if we can try, <laughs> I guess, to yeah. see if there's any connections there. Cause I think that would be, and that's like more we're for adding, you guys to, <laughs> to do, but. Just because it should come to the committee who are I think referenced it, Kristen and Andrew have finalized a draft mm. of the panorama surveys mm. that are really the formative version of the YRBS. Okay. So it's a culture survey that's gonna go out multiple times a year to staff, students and families, and we're getting ready to roll that out later this month. So we'll have ongoing data rolling yeah. in, um, for all those reasons you just named. We don't wanna have to wait two years to get YRBS sure. data. Oh, that's great. That's talking really about good. belonging, and I, just because I was in the high school for a long time last Thursday, um, those little moments that teachers are finding to connect with kids, I started to really have my eyes open as to why our kids feel as connected as they do. It was the gym teacher who took two full minutes with one student to talk about the new sneakers he had on. Yeah. And I thought, 
there it is right there. You just made that student yeah. feel like they matter and they had a discussion. He did weave it into how the Marin gym floor was all scuffed up and maybe the superintendent could help him with that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, that, my audi I, I'm an audience, I understand. Uh, but it's, you know, really great things happening at the high school and the mm -hmm. momentum is really shifted to such student-centered work at all levels. It's just a really great place. Yeah, and I just, I, I, I don't know if you guys, how you came up with those goals, but I applaud them because as someone with a high school student, they, they resonate deeply with me as to what, as a parent, I would be looking for in this day and age for that student because yeah. um, their entire middle school Your through line is back to your school improvement yeah. plan and the strategic Which, plan. All of that and and yeah. Yeah. the gift of the structures from the other programs is yeah. they can align it with... Yeah. And, they and I guess just making sure that we call it out, like mm -hmm. with that, when we look at that data to remind us yeah. that these, you know, it's hard to necessarily, nobody in data likes to talk about causal relationships. I know nobody likes that anymore and no one's doing that, but you know, they, they, these things could be causal and. We would love to align data that shows the progress, right? That's. that's the no one real in research outcome. likes to do that anymore. The, the feeling we're all talking about is fantastic, but to have some data to go with it would be equally fantastic. Yeah, and I think just lastly, the school spirit piece has yeah. been huge this yeah. year because it really feels, it feels stronger than ever for me, at least in my, and again, I know I started in 2019, um, but before COVID even, it just feels really strong with the amount of students who are showing up for games or showing up for performances and all of that. It wasn't, it right. just. I mean, like Prism was sold out the first night. Yeah. Like yeah. every Friday night football game, I mean, yes, the weather was, that helped. But like, regardless, right? They were huge and yeah. they were soccer. And, and yeah, I mean, it's just all been. How many kids went it to helps the helps when you have a state finals. champion soccer team. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's happening in, in basketball and hockey, though. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah the hockey's hockey, coming yeah, out. Yeah, the, so it's just been great. It's for Patriots. I mean, packed. Yeah. Like, in yeah. students from so many different pockets you know like it was so yeah. great it I was thought that so great soccer game. yeah it was like you know it wasn't just kids who played sports yeah it wasn't went to just the, kids it, who want to watch hockey you know it was great yeah. and i think a comment got made at the league discussion on friday about front fridays just a lot of very elementary activities for a lot of high school students and they're thriving love in it. it. They so love I think it. we've understood in a new way like they just want to be together and relax and have fun like a cookie and some frosting and some marshmallows go a long way. Like they're happy to like let their like relax for a little bit yeah. and not worry about their tests and exams and just like mm -hmm. hang out and have some hot yeah. cocoa. Yeah, and, and I think another piece is like seeing that other kids are doing it. Yeah. It doesn't, you know, it's okay to like want to decorate a cookie <laughs> snowman or to do yeah. some mindful coloring right. or you know blow bubbles because yeah. everyone else is doing it and it's fun. So. Any other Thank you. questions before we let Brian and Katie go? Sharon, do you have anything online? No questions, but thank you for the report. It's, it's nice to hear about the student connections and how the staff and how they all relate. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. And I think, you know, just in closing, everything you've done is so intentional. And so even though it might not seem like a big deal to be at a football game, a hockey game, a basketball game, your presence is noticed. It's noticed by kids. It's noticed by parents. I think the flex blocks are so approachable and available to kids, but you know it comes with a lot of work and a lot of collaboration. And we talk in education a lot about you know co-teaching and, and how that's such a great model and teachers teaching together and collaborating. Being co-principals is a great model. And yes, we may not be as conventional as other districts that that have just a principal, but I think we're seeing the benefit of having co-principals and then adding to our admin team so we can really focus on kids. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And I think, and thank you for saying that because I think attending those those events is important and it's yeah. something that we're, you know, there's so much going on at the <laughs> high school. Like we could be busy seven nights a week, um, but we're all, the four of us are really trying to get there and, you know, to support our students and whatever it is that they're into. So thank you for saying that. Okay, so thank you. Yeah. We'll see you in February. We look see forward to it. See you then. To thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thank you very much. Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Drive safe going home. Thank you. Assuming you're going to go. Yeah. Yes. Stay if you like, but you can go. <laughs> All right. So that brings us to the um, solar discussion at CCHS.
Um, and I actually put some slides in the drive that I'm going to share. Let's see if I can pull this up. Um, let me find them. Just to kind of bring us back to campus advisory report. So today I spent some time, well, over the weekend, I spent some time reviewing campus advisory report again and the, um, I'm going to try and pull them up in a second, and also the meeting from May 7th of 2018 where there was a whole presentation done by the campus advisory committee and it was Mary Storrs mostly did it with Kathy Ogden Fasser. I don't know if people remember them. Um, I think Bob Grom is online. He was on school committee then. Court, you were on school committee then. So we have a lot of information. We have a lot of same players in the room. We have um, kind of what brought us to this point. Lori sat on that committee. So the campus advisory committee met 13 times and their charge was to review all the documents and make recommendations to the school committee. We had a 16 member committee and they they came up with their priorities and anyone can jump in if if i'm you know not giving an accurate portrayal of what happened um they came up with five priorities for the campus and so the five i'm going to try and pull these slides up just to share hold on to make it a little easier and i think i have um is it in the packet it's in the packet and while you pull that up, yes, I'll just ahead. recall that it wasn't just the committee that formed the priorities. It was a wide reach in terms of input from the community and um, making sure different uh, groups were heard. So surveys and listening sessions and I think there were a really one big or two public forums. There's involvement yep. of, of you know all stakeholders. Okay. All right. I will share this. Hopefully in the magic, oh, it did go. Um, this is not a um, presentation, so you'll have to bear with me because I'm just gonna kind of scroll through to different parts of it. So they covered what the charge was, and this is all in your packet, um, to study our campus and, you know, really get information from other groups. There's the membership of the group, and we have <laughs> community members, athletic director, superintendent, the rec commission, principals, teachers, assistant principals. So they really had a lot of different stakeholders on that. They have an outline process where they had their 14 meetings, including the site walk, the public input sessions, and then they reviewed all the relevant documents. And when they evaluated um, the different proposals, it was based on the educational impact, the community building, the cost, who benefited, the physical development, sustainability, and revenue generation. So they, there's your beautiful amphitheater right there with students there. You can see that today. They had existing conditions. I'm gonna scroll through this real quick. Um, the use of the landfill and what the restrictions were on that. Yeah, and just worth noting, yeah. that had just been resolved. So that was a new learning curve, was better understanding the landfill and the restrictions on it. Yep. And the, is the land, when we are talking about our campus and the landfill, is that where the skate park is? Yes. Okay. It's, it's on the From left skate park to the, the road. Roasters Hill Road. Okay. Yeah. 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 On the left when That's you just in general. And when they talk about the cap, that was the remediation that was done. And so the cap cannot be penetrated. So like, for example, you couldn't put, um, you put lights in there because you would mm -hmm. penetrate the cap with the footings. So there were certain limitations that they had with the landfill. And we have discussed as a committee that that we're committed to um, helping that become a track. You know, sh once fundraising is in place and all sorts of other things, that is the plan for that area. And then they came up with their recommendations. So in 2018, a big discussion was parking, parking, parking. That is, I think, all everyone talked about was parking. Um, people are still talking about parking in 2024. Mm -hmm. And it still always creates a little bit of tension, but I think it's way better than it was before. So um, we're gonna skip over the parking because that's really not pertinent to our discussion. And our principals didn't mention it tonight. Well, and we've accepted it, I think, yeah. is the answer. In the fall, it's not really a problem. By the spring, it is because so many juniors drive and we just count the days down for the seniors yeah. to leave. I think that's the way the long term is, so, okay. okay. Um, so we have the recommendations, and when I watch back the meeting, 
they did not put them in order. They gave five recommendations for um, what their committee came up with. So one was for the track and field. The next one was for a recreation building, and that could be an indoor ice rink or a field house. And the area, the two areas that they, well, three areas they have placed on that, um, and they're in red. I'll kind of, does that? No, it's fine. It's that fine. Do no, it no, for you? Good. I just like to. Okay, so this close. is, um, and I'll just put my cursor over. I don't know if you can see it. That is the area in front of the Beatty Center. So that's where the current, uh, the best way to describe it is where the, you drop off your unwanted clothing. Oh, those white the, bins. The white bins. That's one area. This longer area is right in front of the Beatty Center. And this third area up here would be up where there's a practice field. That's where all the field events happen for track. And then there was a little bit of discussion of if they put a field house there, then they possibly would relocate a field somewhere in this area. But that, you know, again, this was just possibilities. The only well, thing- and unvetted possibilities. possibilities. Unvetted. Right. Right. I have to stress that because we've pretty much since realized those are really challenging right. ideas. Right. With the restrictions on the campus. Um, another recommendation was for uh, outdoor learning commons. That would be an area that's kind of closer to the building, so you'd have access to the building. I think there was a lot of discussion with Rivers and Revolutions about that, and they had a lot of feedback from students. Uh, there was a recommendation of a potential pavilion in that area, so that's also marked in red. And this is all in the campus advisory report, but when I found these slides, it's it's much clearer than the you know the text of the report. And then the other recommendation was a garden with a greenhouse. So they have one area over here when you approach Walden Street on the right, and then they also have this area across from the Beatty Center. And so that really, I'm gonna stop my share right now. Um, those were the recommendations of that committee. And it was a school committee, campus advisory committee. So they, they formed this committee to get guidance. The school committee asked for guidance. So I feel as though the first part of our discussion has to be, where are we at? Here's the guidance we have from 2018. We have um, paved the road. That was one thing that absolutely needed to be done. The road's been paved, the lighting's been done. We're kind of on our way in the track. We have a warrant article for the amenities building, which is down by Memorial Field. And not we haven't done anything else with this report as our as this school committee. And I think the only other thing that um, was in there was the feasibility. So so from this committee that was in 2018, then came the campus oversight committee. And that committee started talking about what's actually possible to build on that campus. And that's where we found the drawings of the amenities building um, and just the track. the track and what the potential cost might be for that and what's actually feasible. So that kind of brings us to our present discussion, which is on, so we've been approached by the solar task force. They would like to put solar on the roof of the high school property and also on that area in front of the Beatty Center. So that's really what our discussion tonight is gonna to focus on is, you know, where do we all feel the direction of this is going? Because um, this is for our committee to discuss and review and get eventually get back to the Solar Task Force as to how we feel about it. We will probably have to take a vote. They have put forth a warrant article for town meeting. Um, and in that warrant article, that should be in your packet also. I think it's uh, maybe like about $2 million, one, you know, to cover, they will cover the cost, the town will cover, and I shouldn't say the town. Yeah. The light board will move the article to borrow the money to install the solar. So it won't be of cost to us, but we would then have to go into an agreement and that kind of brings us a little further down the road. So the purpose of tonight's discussion is really to review where we're at, how we're feeling about this, and just have a general discussion about the needs of our campus. Can I add one yep. new piece that came up last week? I met um, with the 250th Tree Committee. Krista Zahn, she'll correct me if that's not the right title. Um, they have- It's the Memorials planted. Committee. It's the Permanent Memorials uh, Committee. Under, under yes. It's focused a, on 250 yes. trees planted around town as part of the 250th um, and funded, funded through a combined CPC and town 
effort. So the request when I was invited to the committee was to go through each school property and talk on what benefit you know we might have for ideas to plant more trees. Obviously, that would all be vetted through both committees. But because of this good discussion, it's worth really noting that the first idea they had was on the high school property was more trees around the drainage basin and really greenifying that area as well as um, a, a cove towards the Walden Street entrance. So um, I said that needed to get brought up fairly quickly given this other conversation about solar in the same space essentially. And I think you'll just want to factor in that there's another vision there as well that has now been brought to us from the 250th. And I did um, talk to Krista, who is the chair of that committee, just a very, you know, early discussion of what the vision was. And it would be possibly that Walden Street entrance on the right and somewhere in the drainage area. And then also a donation at our other schools too. So with the middle school, um, Thoreau. All of them. I think all of we them. We talked about all of them all last of them. week. Okay, yeah. okay. So, so it's a larger scale project. Yes. So, since the agenda item is focused on the solar, what mm -hmm. do you want to get accomplished tonight? I want to see where where do we all feel about that area? Because that's really what it comes down to is we need to discuss, is that area something that we want to consider for solar? Because ultimately this committee will have to decide if that's permissible to us or not. I guess that would be the basic question. Well, we're not going to vote tonight on anything. We don't vote, so I'm in favor of it. Unless convinced otherwise. <laughs> the of the solar. Yes. In the basin. Correct. And in the campus advisory report, regardless of the campus advisory report, you'd be in the campus advisory report, they were told that we couldn't do solar because we couldn't deal with the solar. So I need some clarification from the light board too. Um, and I have some questions out there. So I guess when I rewatched that meeting from 2018, there was no discussion about solar. I know it's in the report. So in the advisory report, it states um, solar on roofs, not on land. And one piece of it was the ability for CMLP to put the solar there. But the other piece was really preserving open space. I respect the campus advisory committee report. I think that's the least expensive most doable um, solar. If we want to investigate putting up uh, things over the parking lot, that's going to be significantly more expensive. But I think we, we need to do more solar in town. That's clear. Okay. I would offer up that the uh, committee in, in 2018 uh, brought forth some very nice recommendations, but to your point, uh, solar was not on the table because the light plant wasn't ready to move on it, and they are prepared now. That's been made explicit. Um, and well, except also, for the light board hasn't voted on it yet, have they? Have they? No, they have not. No, okay. No, okay. they are doing. They have done what we are trying to do, do tonight. Yeah. yeah. Is straw poll first discussion, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. Um, in regard to that uh, campus advisory committee, uh, I'm not sure we can put uh, uh, too much emphasis on it because look what we're doing now. We want a uh, uh, $2.3 million set of toilets. That was not in the report, and yet that's our big uh, that's our big move right now. So, mm -hmm. so that committee did very good work, but uh, it didn't uh, inform us as to what we should be doing now. Mm -hmm. And the amenities building, as we call it, I think is is a good example of how they it, was. It, was it the assumption that that was necessary to do? It certainly became the assumption the next year in the, in the next committee, committee in the oversight. I'm trying committee. to make the point that the. Uh, report in 2018 did not chart out exactly what we should be doing in 2023 and one of my examples is that we're moving on an amenities building. Mm -hmm. In regard to the request from the Solar Task Force, uh, my hope is that we would uh, uh, allow the task force with the light board with uh, the school committee to look very carefully at what it might uh, mean to bring uh, good generation on that campus because it is one of the few public plots that uh, rises uh, very high on the list of potentials. Our ability to or our willingness to partner with Solar Task Force is not a commitment to installation. 
it's a, a commitment to can we make it work? And then we all get to decide if we mm -hmm. can make it work. And I think you and I have heard, maybe others, very explicitly from the chair of that committee, if this school committee says not interested, then their work is done. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, they're, they're, they're willing to fold up and give up on the regional school district. Mm -hmm. They'd prefer not to. Uh, they'd prefer to do the homework so that a decision process could be uh, one that was careful and thorough but they're not gonna do all of that homework unless uh, uh, we have a willingness to keep the discussion open. And if we're not gonna keep it open, then the sooner we close it, the better, so they can go on their way. To your question primarily though, are we interested, I'm interested in seeing what this could look like. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Alexa. Um, when I read the warrant article, which I have in front of me now, the warrant article reads that it just sort of designates the campus. It does not, as best as I can see, unless it's in this fine print, designate specifically the basin or specifically the roof where you brought up, you know, like canopies over um, the parking lot, right? Um, so my, my feeling is as it's written, I think it's 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 a it's a challenge for me whether to in, in, endorse it or not. Um, I I certainly am philosophically committed to solar, and I am one hundred percent committed philosophically to putting it on the roof. Um, when I when I look at the campus, I would and and, and given how quickly this has come into our lap, just again for timeline purposes. Uh, Tracy and I met with Mr. Banfield, who is the chair of the Solar Task Force, in mid-October. So, um, you know, we're only 60 or so days, 60, 90 days past that. Um, I am concerned that I'd be hesitant to so quickly give up what is like the last available unrestricted or undefined, if you will, green space. You know, the fields are certainly green space, but they have designated uses. Um, we've sort of identified the designated use for the green space, you know, towards towards uh, Route 2 on uh, where, we're, where we're thinking of uh, pushing a track. This is the, so this area is the last of it. So to me, what I would like to see would be um, a revision of the warrant to, to include only the roof of the building. Whether or not we choose to do more solar on the basin in years to come because we ascertain and eh, there's not really much we can do with this last available green space, that's a different matter. I just, I, I, I think to give that up so quickly, um, and especially in light of um, the 250th and, and their alternative vision for that space, um, what I would like to see for the warrant would be a revision to talk only about the roof. I think to me, that's a much easier endorsement. Okay. I, I tend to agree. Um, I think for similar reasons, but slightly different. I think we are undergoing a, like a very major solar project at a middle school. And I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of learning that goes along with that. Um, and mistakes intended by nobody, oh, but like yeah. that we're gonna learn from that we will only be better at these big mm -hmm. projects um, as a result of it. So I think my feeling is similar that I, I fully support solar. I would love to see more solar in town. Um, and I would love to see it at the high school I am not quite sure, I, I don't know that we should have two major projects going on at two schools at the same time before we finalize one and see how it's working, what we've learned and how we can do it better next time. Um, so I, I think I'm not opposed to it. I just am not, I don't think I'm there yet, if that makes sense. I don't think I've had, I think there's too many ways that we could use that space and I'd like to be thoughtful about that. And I do love this idea of the tree planting. I think that's such a um, 
great opportunity for our town too um, and for our schools to be part of that. There's very little space at the high school to do it. So I'd be I'd like to consider all of the options before moving forward. Okay. Um, Carrie. I'm for the solar. Okay. What? For the solar. I am yeah. on the campus. I, I, um, I have a question about that yep. catchment area of the basin. What what kind of trees could be planted in a in a basin designed to collect water? It'd be the periphery of the basin from my understanding in a very, very quick conversation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I think we have Sharon, Domingos, Aisha, any thoughts? I think Domingos has his hand up. Go ahead. Hi, guys. Happy New Year. Uh, I was dying to be here, but got caught up at work. But um, as far as the solar panels uh, being put on that specific area, um, I don't agree with that. I think that area should be saved for future buildings. Um, for the school, because again, the community is growing in different ways, and eventually um, the funds will be generated to add to those areas. Uh, placing them on the roof uh, would be a great addition, or even to the actual parking lot, um, like they do at different schools. That would be uh, a better use of the area than taking away that, that empty space that's there now that could be uh, used for the track. Uh, in the future, and also um, with the trees, um, the more the merrier. Um, if, if, if that's something that that basic area, um, I, I recommend using it uh, as much as possible. Um, as you know, um, for every tree that we replace or we take down, we are, uh, I'm not gonna say forced, but we're, 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 we're advised here in Boston to, to replace them. And the city comes out and, and does a very great job with that. Uh, if that's something that can be done, it also uh, adds to uh, the curriculum, especially with earth science. So depending on what tree the school decides to use, it's, it, it's a great addition to the area uh, to bring in something that's not common, commonly found. You know, evergreens are everywhere. Uh, maple, uh, maple trees uh, sometimes uh, are not in every area. So, you know, just thinking about what type of trees will go there would also make the conversation move forward. Okay, thank you. Um, Aisha, any thoughts? No, I disagree with um, just, you know, doing one one thing at a time and mm -hmm. just seeing, you know, what we can learn from the first. You know. mm -hmm. Okay, and let's see, Sharon? Hi, I definitely think there are benefits to solar but I think we need more time to really consider if this school campus is the place for it. I, I lean more towards conserving green space and um, to, if there could be other municipal properties where I think solar could be more beneficial. That, that's kind of where I am on it. Okay, thank you. Um, and then I guess the only other thing, you know, before we kind of close up our discussion on this for tonight because this will come back to us again. Um, I will say like one thing that Mary Story said that really resonated with me, I had to type it. She said, the priority of the campus advisory committee was to serve the needs of the students and to be student focused. So that kind of hit me and, and I guess from my perspective, I, I mean, I think solar would be fantastic on the roof. Um, I, I think I could fully support it on the roof. I just think that green space, I think there is a future need of that space. I think it's something that, you know, is on our goals. Our goals are the CCHS campus facility. Yes, we started with the amenities building, but I think that was always the assumption that we're out of compliance. So that is something that is necessary by law to do versus uh, the, tr the track will be great to have when it does happen, but we don't have the money to do that right now. And it's, you know, what are we gonna ask for? So I fully support solar, but I think that I fully support it on the roof. And, and even with the roof, we still have some hurdles to get through. We still have to talk about MOAs, or I'm gonna confuse it, the MOA or the MOU. Um, we have one at Willard right now, and I did ask Lori and Bob just to give us an update of kind of what that looks like in reality, because we do have solar at Willard. So 
Can you just speak to that just really briefly? Yeah, at a very high level, the MOUs, uh, the electricity actually feeds the building, so it's avoided electric costs. So about 10% of the building is um, powered through the solar panels directly. Uh, we have in the MOU, most of it's uh, taken on by CMLP. Maintenance of the panels is not, so we have spent about 11,000 over the life of the panels for some things that have needed to happen there. Um, overall, it's been positive and smooth, so that's great news and I think a win-win and a great little test model to have us keep studying. We can pull the energy usages at a more, a deeper level. Of, we probably should do that so we can all yeah. really learn it and understand it better. Okay. But would it be the same structure where we would benefit from the solar that, that has not been our understanding because okay. CMLP has to borrow for and just like the middle school project, the they have to school, borrow. That's why I was assuming. So it, that uh, reduces the ability for it to be direct offset to the electric at the school. And do we have an MOU with uh, CMLP for the middle school? Not yet. That would be interesting. <laughs> What's on the list for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and there have been some organizational changes at CMLP too. Mm -hmm. So um, Dave Woods last day is Friday. Mm -hmm. So that's just another just information for the committee to. Jason is the interim. Jason is the interim, yeah. Um, when you refer to the catch basin as green space, I don't necessarily agree with that because it's, it's part of the stormwater management system. Mm -hmm. It's not something we just say, well, let's go build something there. So, I mean, it, it would be a disaster if we just built something there, turned into a parking lot, but we'd have well, you, water issues. You yeah, you won't be allowed to do that. Yeah. Like we checked that in there. with yeah. the town level folks, NRC and um, planning and et cetera, all the permitting requires the catch basin. Does solar fit into that permitting? So in the first pass of feedback that I got and just putting a feeler out, the impervious surface was a question and the town engineer would need to weigh in. They didn't see permitting problems per se in terms of the other boards. They did have impervious service questions and felt the town engineer would need to review the project once the design was made. And the, um, the recommendation from the Camps Advisory Committee, if something were to be built in that area, you would have to deal with the stormwater drainage system. So if you built anything there, you would still have to deal with your stormwater. So that would have to be re-engineered and that would have to factor into any project. Like if you decided, for example, to do the large scale field house there, you would have to revamp the whole area. Were solar to go in the actual stormwater basin, it would require some engineering because it would change the distribution of the water Mm -hmm. The same water would arrive there, but it would arrive there in a different way because it was being deflected. So it's doable. It's been done many times before, but uh, it wouldn't be the same as putting it on a, uh, a piece of land that was not stormwater management uh, for, for a design. Yeah, and that's what we don't have that piece, correct, from the engineers. No, they nor can't do they look want to at do it, it until they have a plan. Interested. Right, exactly. exactly. They don't want to waste the time and money on solutions. Mm -hmm. This school committee mm -hmm. isn't interested. Mm -hmm. And I guess the only other thing would be if anyone has any other questions that they feel um, they'd like answered. Well, I think we're getting into the chicken and egg thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, like Court said, we don't have a full a design that says exactly this, that, and the other. Mm -hmm. you know? Trees, yes, trees, no. Current, existing trees, yes, you know. So that that's sort of the thing. And it's still up to us, right? If right. this passes a town meeting, whether we endorse it or we don't, it's still up to us whether this can happen. If, if we they, vote no, I mean, I guess they go away, right? They, they don't move the, or then what would change that? the article. Would it go to town meeting? That, like, can they, vote, can they go to town no, meeting? I don't, they will withdraw it. If we don't, if we don't support it, they'll withdraw it. They have said, they've been clear about that. Okay. But so, but I guess, so which is, which brings me back to my question, which, you know, um, it, it isn't clear on the way the warrant article language is written about the, the cost of the 9.2 million, what's allocated to the, the parcel of land across the highway, what's allocated to the roof on the, high school campus and what's allocated to the basin. To me, I would be, again, far more willing to entertain um, 
solar on the roof and give a tacit endorsement um, because, you know, I'm not seeking to build anything on that space. I like the fact that it is an unbuilt space and keeping it that way. That's what I sort of call what I call it green. It's built. It's vegetation. It's um, I recommend that we wait until the public hearing where we see the full slides and then we take a vote after that. We hear the, the public hearing, uh, February, March. But I, I think the Solar Task Force is really, they have pushed us for a, an answer, so to speak. I mean, I think they wanna know before they get to the hearing well, process. Can you find out if, if it's that, I mean, I'm, I'm getting confused I felt, I felt like it was line. urgent, yeah, I felt like it was urgent. I don't know, I haven't heard from them. I, you're telling me it is. So I, I mean, I've I've attended um, a few of their meetings. No, I, I've watched their meetings, and you know, and some of them more, were uncomfortable. I got more of the yeah. impression from even hearing your discussions with them is they just wanted us to have a discussion, not necessarily to vote. Well, they actually they wanted us to take a vote um, back in I think November, and we weren't. It was like bring it to the school committee. The school committee will vote to partner with them. The vote would be to partner with them. That's what they're asking. That was their ask. Their original ask. Not to vote in the warrant article. So that's so, two different things. It is two different things, yeah. So I, I think you're, you're asking us whether we would support the warrant article, not whether we would partner with them. Well, I think we're, are we supporting solar in that space? I think that is the ultimate question. And so what I'm hearing tonight from our committee is it appears as though four of us are not in support of it in that area and three are in support of it in that area. And okay. correct me if I'm wrong. But potentially more are supportive of it on the roof. Yes. Yes. Okay. So if you have any other questions that come up, um, if you need anything else, please let me know. And it was my understanding that we will not get the energy use at the high school from it. So we would have to enter into, you know, an agreement as to how to do it, even whether it's on the roof or wherever it is. Yeah. Um, and then I guess the only other question that I had too was just, the battery storage would be at the high school and at the landfill. I think there's some at the landfill, some at the high school, because those are the two areas that they're looking to move on. Okay, all right, great. All right, so we will move on to um, our quarterly reports and transfers, and I will hand this to Bob. Bob has sent us two memos regarding the CCHS budget. Okay, so I distributed them. Um, it's fairly still um, early in the year. You can see from the report um, for the region, there are some um, adjustments, mostly small. Uh, the one adjustment that's uh, a little bit significant is um, for instructional leadership, and we had um, our leadership model, an increase of an additional FTE in the leadership model to two co-principals, two assistant principals, which is offset by savings on uh, teacher um, retirement savings and uh, tutor costs. So that's the net uh, $69,000 adjustment and the rest are, are fairly minor. The fixed charges is a little bit up on um, workers' comp insurance. Um, and then I just wanted to point out too, um, the programs with other districts, um, the remaining balance shows is negative. We haven't yet applied IDA grant funds. Uh, we're also anticipating potential circuit breaker extraordinary relief through a special bill um, that came through the state. And lastly, we're applying for a METCO special ed grant that we're not guaranteed to get. We did apply. Um, we, did, we have received it a couple years, but it's not something that we're guaranteed to get. So that's a competitive grant? Is it not a formula grant? I don't. I'm not, I, I, I don't know that it's competitive. It's I a need-based grant. The funding resources have varied widely, so we were excited to see it come back out again within the last couple of weeks, hoping we're gonna have some of our needs qualify. So um, that's the um, that, that's the high-level view of the, the regional um, budget, and I don't know if we have it. The, the um, intent then would be to vote these quarterly as we typically do, just the just the transfers and adjustments. Any questions? Oh, okay, and then we'll move on to the CCRSD budget. Yeah, I'll, can I start with that and then you can chime in? Um, so we 
we haven't stopped looking at budgets just because we brought you a budget and um, asked you to vote a recommendation. Uh, so in the re ongoing review of the high school salaries, we've realized an opportunity to um, suggest a reduction in the math department and, and then an offset to some of that reduction because of the need in a special education space in math. So the com combination would result in a reduction of 0.75 FTE in math. It looks like SPED and math together. It depends on the setting. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be a total recommendation to reduce the entire CCRSD FY25 budget by $110,394. Bob's done some of the breakouts, so you can see the Concord Carlisle splits and the impact to the assessments and the overall percentage increases with that change. We aren't asking you to vote anything tonight. We wanted to bring it to you first. Um, if you're supportive, we you know, certainly can have a discussion in two weeks. And I did get clarification from Carmen Reese that we, if we do vote to reduce it, the number can be the number in the warrant um, mm -hmm. by the reduced number because that mm -hmm. won't go to print until the 24th and our meeting is on the 23rd. <laughs> so that's... You can still reduce it at town meeting. You, we can reduce it on the floor. So I think much it, nicer it, if it's, it's nicer when correct it's correct reduced. Reduced. Right. And I think, you know, I, I guess I would note that we are under the FinCom guideline. Um, yes. Yeah. So th this is the confusing part, but with the assessment, we're not. So overall, the budget is 3.08, but the assessment to Concord is more because of the enrollment shift. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on that a little bit. We're now under $100,000 from the Concord guideline, which as you'll recall is level funded with the CPS guideline um, when they built that. A few things to just note that aren't factored in when you level fund it like that is one, the enrollment shift, which has swung a bit to Concord for about five, 55 or $60,000 and all the things that the CPS in town consider non-guideline insurance, workers' comp, things like unemployment that we have within guidelines. So typically we get a little bit more consideration on the high school budget um, and get a little higher guideline there. So for that reason. Yeah, which I guess that's my long-winded way to say I don't know that we're going to be able to get to guideline because we've been back through this and some of those other factors are contributing to why we are still where we are. And just another just interesting point that um, Alexa and I have our chairs meeting tomorrow and we've reached out to chairs from other districts just to kind of see like, how is your budget looking this year? You know, you know what's happening? Um, at AB, they're having an override. Bedford's looking for 6%. Bedford Stan only does a 3.5% every year. Their fin time gives them 35 but they're looking for 6% this year. Belmont's looking for a 778. Like it's, it's very interesting to just see what's happening in other towns, so. Can you ask them if they're, uh, I think, um, I think AB proposes three different tiered budgets. Yep. Can you ask that question? Yeah. So they have a level yeah. service and they have a reductions budget and then they have. Um, yeah, they do, Adam. <laughs> we call our chair's group the Adam <laughs> Client Support Group. Um, he's the chair <laughs> and uh, yeah, he did make mention of those three budgets and I forget, uh, but there, I know that they're, their guideline budget would necessitate the full closing of several schools. I think it's I think it's one school, and it's a large layoff. Anyway, so yeah, so um, you know, it was it was fairly, you know, extreme. Was under a big layoff last year or two. Mm -hmm. Sort of. They they clarified that it was. Um, about AB. AB. Yeah. yeah. So non-tenured teachers only. Yeah, well, and not only that, all of their teachers. So for example, we have aides in all of our kindergarten classes. They have aides all the way through, I think grade six. So they laid off their aides to sort of be more. So it was not, you know, yeah, to your yeah. non-tenured teachers. It was not quite the, when he, when he learned that it was school, not quite yeah, the. At the high school was like one from every department. Yeah. They had to make a yeah. large reduction there were, last year. Going but down. the bulk yeah. of it was those. Yeah. Uh, the class sizes will be bigger. Not yes, the class classes. size could be bigger. Yeah. Right. yeah. So just uh, just an interesting note. So you know, if you ever have anything like that that you want Adam to Adam isn't coming group, tomorrow to our meeting now. Cynthia, okay, we'll, I, he already RSVP'd. No, we'll, we'll, we'll ask so him. We can ask him by email. The AB chair. The we'll AB chair. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, he can't come tomorrow, but um, but we'll ask nonetheless. He did. He did make mention of those three tiered plans. One of which, again, was 
to paraphrase him, sort of catastrophic. Yeah. Yeah. I've talked to Peter. It's, and it's, then, you know, we also put mm -hmm. out the question about capital. How do you deal with capital? And um, so it's just, you know, it's been great to just bounce things around to other towns. And uh, if somebody could post the FY25 budgets to our budget page, they're not up there. Sure. Because, I mean, I know you can hunt around through our agendas, but. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I think. So we will vote on this next week. Next, week. next meeting. January Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Third. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions about the regional budget? Okay. With that, we'll go to our action items. Um, the first would be to approve the November 2023 bullying plan. I believe there's language in the agenda on that. Well, we actually linked the, the bullying plan itself, I believe. I just want to, and Kristen can chime in. Uh, as part of the DESI review that just occurred, you'll recall we had brought you a version of needing to make some changes. It evolved over the coming month or so that DESI essentially said, here's the template you need to use. And we need you to do that. So this is the template that DESI um, needs us to use and we're asking your approval. It's legally driven, not one that we gave feedback on and not likely one that we can accept too much feedback from you all on, but um, we're hoping for your approval. The only problem is they sent you the 2010. There's a 2014 template I just found today. We did what we were asked to do by DESI. So it's so very weird because the plan says it has all the input from the community, which this clearly does not. We haven't. So initial plans and reapproval of plans are two different things is one thing that was clarified. The bullying law when it first went in needed all of those processes. The reapproval is formality. Hmm. Well, I don't support that. Is the, is the deal we need to post something now? We have posted this per Desi's direction. So when would we have an actual bullying plan? Would this is the bullying plan oh. for the state. Do you like it? Like is yes, it, it covers all aspects of the law. But the law, it says that we should have input from the community. For the original bullying plan when the law was passed, that was the case. You do not need to reinvent that every two years, which is how often the committee's meant to re-approve it. We just met with Desi and had extensive conversations with the compliance monitors to bring you this recommendation. So you may vote no, but if we have a majority vote no, no I no, honestly I, don't know where that leaves I us. Understand <laughs> that, but I just feel like we should have a community discussion about our bullying plan. That, that's what I think. I feel like that's a different, we're happy to have a public yeah. sharing no, I understand of the bullying I'm saying plan. I don't wanna just drop this and then two years later, this is all we have. So I think we need to have some timeline come at the next meeting or the meeting Do after. we know when the last time we had such a discussion two years ago would have been 21 we didn't well, do part it. of the corrective work we needed to do was to start approving it i don't know any district that follows the every two year reapproval. it gets lost in the shuffle sure. consistently which is why they monitor us to help be sure things like that don't slide Thanks. through i don't know anyone that does a big public output and input process to reapprove the plan and to underscore Lori's point, if you look at any of the districts, Lexington is a good example, who have already been through the civil rights review, which we just passed, everyone has this same template of their bullying. Yeah, so that was, I guess, my next question. Were we to have had a community outreach for input, does Desi then say, Thank you for that input. Here's the template anyway, kind of thing. <laughs> yes, because the yeah, no, 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 law I, I, was based. I, I, I was truly yeah. an authentic. Law was based on the original okay. rollout of the bullying law, which was decades ago. So, so it seems like perhaps Desi's directives are a smidge at odds, whereas they, they no, asked they're for making this sure we are fully compliant. Well, because they're saying the implementation of the input every two years. Law. Understood. Sorry. Okay. Got it. Do we have this posted now, the same 2010 version with the previous date of approval? Is that what people would no, say? No, it's just posted. It doesn't say that it's been approved. It was posted so the community had access to it per the directive that, that Desi gave us. Okay. 
It's better than nothing. Yeah, I'm, I'm prepared to uh, proceed with it. Uh, I am this curious about a about newer template, oh. whether that would be worth a look. Just well, it has a, there are a few changes in the law, <laughs> but if that's what Dusty wants, then they're the boss. Yeah, we, we really can't change it, or we're going to have to notify the state, and we're going to be I'm swirling. I'm just so. suggesting I'm curious about a newer template. Yeah, which is on their website. Yeah. So I would entertain a motion to approve the November 2023 bullying plan as attached to our agenda. So moved. Do you have a second? Second. Any further discussion? I'm just a little curious about the titling because is it indeed, the, is it, it's in fact the 2010 plan that has been reaffirmed in 2024, am I correct? 2014. No. Oh, oh, our, yeah, no, yeah, we would have this it. Is, this is what Desi, when they came out in November, told us that we needed to do to be in compliance, correct? Correct. Yeah. Okay. So they want it named As 2010. They, they handed us they handed us. Okay, the got plan it. Just making sure, it. just making yeah. sure. So, regardless of what's posted where, what date it is, this is what Desi gave us in November of 2023 that to be in compliance, we needed to post this as our bullying plan. Oh, I understand that. What I'm suggesting just is if we approve a November 2023 bullying plan, there is no such thing as a November 2023 bullying plan. It's just it's listed in the agenda. We are like re-voting in 2024. That is just how we provide it to you. I the understand. Agenda. I'm just saying, we, let's have, mm -hmm. let's have it uh, referenced correctly going out the door. That's all. We don't have a 20, November 2023 bullying plan. It's only listed that way on the agenda. The website doesn't say it that way. Okay. So I'm going to amend my motion. Can I withdraw it and then amend it? Yes. Withdraw it. Withdraw I'll, withdraw it. It. I'll withdraw my motion. And so I would entertain a motion to approve the um, DESI recommended bullying plan as listed on our website. So moved. Perfect. Second. Second. We have and to any further discussion yet? Yeah, we have to roll call vote. So roll call, please. Anderson, I for both. Booth, I for both. Rana, I for both. Tell, I for region. Rainy, I for both. Rankin, I for both. With, I for region. Okay, perfect. And then we move on to our quarterly reports and transfers. So I would entertain a motion to approve the CCRSD FY24 quarterly report and transfers as presented. So moved. You have a second? Second. Okay, and any further discussion? Thank you, Bob. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you, Bob. And roll call. Anderson, aye. Who's aye? Toronto, aye for both. Oh, for region, sorry. Tell I for a region. Rainy I. Frank and I. <laughs> With I for region. Okay, great. And oh, the last vote is on a vote to declare the bus surplus. And do you want to talk about that? I do. Um, I also need to clarify something. If yep. you can see on the attachment, um, there's four buses listed. The second column lists the district. So we do need to vote this in both districts. Um, there's one bus that's a regional bus. Three of them are CPS buses. So when we get to um, this Concord School Committee, it's just the same attachment that we're looking at. It's just um, three buses. We could just vote it now. We just vote it now. We just vote it now. For both. We'll just vote for both. Okay. Yep. Okay. And um, I just wanted to clarify too that the trade-ins will be applied to the respective districts. So. Well, we will be leasing two in each district. The dollars for the trade-ins of the CPS vehicles, the lease cost will be a little bit less because we have a higher trade-in for CPS. Um, so just wanted everybody to know we're keeping our districts uh, clean there. Okay, any questions for Bob? Nope. Okay, so I would entertain a motion, a mo I would entertain a <laughs> vote to declare the buses surplus as listed in the agenda. So moved. And any further discussion? Nope. And this is a vote for both districts, so roll call. Anderson, I for both. Booth, I for both. Murano, I for both. Tell for region. Rainy, I for both. Rankin, I for both. With, I for region. Okay, and with that, I will adjourn the Concord Carlisle Regional School Committee. Thank you to our Carlisle members. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Thanks, Sharon. Thank you. Thank you.
All right. Alexa, my apologies. That's With okay. two minutes note, I'm disappearing. I'll see you at the next meeting. Bye, Courtney. Thanks, Court. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna turn it over to Bob to continue with his um, discussion of quarterly transfers and reports, but this time at the Concord Public Schools. So again, this is uh, our quarterly reporting. Uh, for Con This one's for Concord Public Schools. Thank you. Good night. Um, the um, way we're reporting is in accordance with kind of prior quarters. We're by DESI function category, the top level category, so what we call the 1000 level. Um, you can see at this point in the year, there have been uh, relatively minimal adjustments at the 1,000 level. Um, I will comment on um, the, the bottom line uh, showing programs with other districts, which is primarily out of district uh, tuitions. Um, we have applied all of the circuit breaker budgeted funds, um, and I, I did it in advance instead of waiting. So you can see the expenditures number is negative. As we have expenditures come in, um, that, will, that will flip positive. Um, it was just more for the sake of efficiency and to um, plug in to Circuit Breaker exactly what we budgeted. <clears throat> um, the remaining balance shows a deficit of 448,000. Uh, we have not yet applied the IDA grant funds, which will um, offset that uh, negative balance. In addition, there's some possibility of uh, we will not get um, additional funding um, for, there's possibility of getting a MECO special ed grant we will not get uh, anything from the state for the potential additional circuit breaker and CPS, just in, uh, more likely in the region. Um, so that's kind of where we are uh, at this point in the year. Um, this feels like we're in uh, decent shape. Okay, um, thank you, Bob. Does anyone have any questions? No. Nope. Thank you, Bob. Okay, thank you so much. Um, all right, this is um, my opportunity to um, talk to everybody. At our January 19th meeting, we passed um, a policy on facilities naming um, at the Concord Public School. And um, as such, pursuant to that policy, we are announcing this evening that we are opening a renaming consideration process for the Concord Middle School. Um, so I just want to get it, everything out into the public so that we can um, ensure um, some active participation in this process as we move forward. So as of this evening, um, we are accepting submissions for suggestions um, as to what to name the, or rename the Concord Middle School. We are gonna accept submissions for a full two weeks. So the first two weeks um, will be open. The way um, we recommend people to um, submit those um, suggestions would be via email. Um, we want them in written form. You can send them to me as the chair or you can send them um, to the school committee through our form. Um, I'm gonna ask that they're due by noon of January 23rd, only because we have a meeting that night. Um, and I want to make sure that um, we have ample time to collect them all and whatnot. At our January 23rd meeting, we will make public announcement of all the submissions we have received in um, our two week period. Um, at, that, at the conclusion of that, then we sort of pivot to what's called a public comment period. Um, a public comment period will be the full additional two weeks um, whereby the public can sort of give us feedback about the names. Um, we are seeking that feedback again via email predominantly. Um, and again, same thing, you can submit it by our form or to our email address, which is Concord School Committee at ConcordPS.org. And then finally, the conclusion of it all will be on February 6th where um, we will have extended public comment at our meeting. Um, it was really interesting, I had, um, which is essentially synonymous with a hearing, but what was interesting when I spoke with the MASC, I said, you know, can you talk to me um, in our, in some previous language we have, you know, we've used the word hearings, DESI and the state and the MASC, um, call, use sort of the nomenclature public comment period. And what was interesting to me was um, Alicia Mallon, I'm very grateful to her guidance. She was saying, you know, a hearing 
um, is a dialogue. It is an opportunity for um, really questions to the school committee. And she said the reason in our policy that we recommend to you all, the reason why we call it public comment is in that time, you're really seeking one one way feedback. There's no like real questions that anyone would have. Um, so so we're seeking public comment. So we are gonna we are gonna see we're gonna extend our public comment that evening um, to ensure that as many voices can be heard as possible. Um, so we're really excited for that, and then we will vote that evening on February sixth. So um, you know just to sort of recap to date, I think we've had well over 100 emails, I think, um, but, but at least 100 emails um, on this topic. We've had, we've already had, I think, extensive public comment um, here at our meetings. Um, I do want to ensure, too, for everyone who has emailed us already or made public comment, um, I do want to make sure that we everybody knows we will be including those sort of in our aggregate um, public comment. So if you've made a public comment, please don't feel compelled to come back. We've, we've, we've listened to it, we've digested it, and similarly too with your emails. All of those emails will be um, given weight, and I think that's really important, and I want to make sure um, that people know that the voices that they've lent to this discussion have, have, will, be, will be fully considered. Um, I also wanted to talk to you all and um, I wanted to discuss this because even though I'm kind of a pro at this because I, this was my job on the middle school building committee, I did just want to throw out what our communication strategy will be to ensure that um, everybody, that, that we're getting the word out. Um, we are going to leverage the Concord Bridge. I think we've already put out our process to the Concord Bridge um, in a formal capacity. They will go to print. Um, and be published on January 12th. Um, they do go online earlier. I didn't check today whether um, it was online, but hopefully it will be. Um, it, uh, so actually, I take it back. I'm gonna go through what the things we're gonna do and then I'm gonna tell you the, or the, the tools we're gonna use to leverage them. So the first thing we're gonna do is ensure that this process is advertised and out there and accessible to everyone. Um, Second, and that will that will happen now, this week, immediately. Um, then the second piece that is gonna be pushed out to the community at large are the the submissions that we that we receive, the list of um, submissions that will go out after our January 23rd meeting. Um, then we will do additionally to that a formal advertisement, even though, you know. I, I go back and forth about whether we're to call this a hearing. I think we can do that. We're gonna, um, but again, the, the, the feedback, we're, we're soliciting feedback and I wanna make sure people know that. It's not about questions, it's about us soliciting feedback. So we will put a formal advertisement of our extended public comment or hearing. Um, I think that is the requisite amount to do that is two weeks in advance, so we will do that as well, and then we'll do shortly before the February 6th meeting, a reminder meeting that we will be voting that night <coughs> and that there and we will be entertaining public comment live in our meeting. The way we're gonna do those sort of four things, um, we're gonna leverage the Concord Bridge. They um, have both print versions and online ver versions. We're gonna leverage the superintendent's weekly update. <coughs> um, so she'll be including all of that information to her subscribers. Um, good news is we doubled our subscriber list last year, so we'll also be leveraging our um, school committee uh, subscriber list, which again has, uh, did we have doubled it? And then also we'll be asking for partnership with the town. They maintain their own subscriber list um, and their own mechanisms, social media. Lori, I know, I don't know, do you still use your social media? Oh, yeah. Yes, okay. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, so again, to recap, we'll use the bridge, the superintendent's weekly update, our own school committee subscriber list, the town of Concord subscriber list, and any um, associated social I media. Um, I don't think I've missed anything because I, um, again, I've done this for the uh, building committee and was very successful, um, but open to any thoughts or suggestions on the comm strategy. So this feels very rushed. I know we gave you that feedback. Um, is this anywhere available publicly? Because it's opening today. So it should have been publicly available last week. Today's the start of the period. Nobody even knew it was 
Well, right. So we're going to get that out immediately um, by right, all just, of those. I felt like it, it should be a, like a. We're week, making week it public tonight. I know, but it should be like a month of comments. Actually, it's really interesting. So I worked extensively on this plan with the MASC. We're um, the school committee, not the MASC. I appreciate I that. But, but to me, it's really important that um, we utilize best practices. You know, that's why Tracy and I have our chairs meeting. <clears throat> I think it is important for us to sort of see what um, experts in the room who do this, who advise committees all over the Commonwealth, what their feedback is, um, look at what other committees are doing. So, you know, generally, um, the suggestion is two weeks. I wanted to ensure be? that we had a full four weeks. Where will this be prominently displayed on our school website? We can we can put that on. I'll put it right on the banner of the main page if you Great. sure. What will we expect in these submissions besides a name? That is all we we do expect. We can people I'm sure are going to write a little bit about why um, they're making the recommendation. But I, but we didn't want to make it such a prescriptive well, our process. Our policy does have a recommendation, though. It says right, isn't that written policy? request should specify the intent of the requester and the reasons why this particular name would fit the facility. Okay, great. We can, yeah. It should it offer appropriate background information on the personal organization after which the facility will be named. All right, we can push that out. We can push that piece out on the policy. So on all of these, um, Four things we I can we use should, that. I think we should include language. the policy yeah. with it when you push right. it out. I mean, you Do can't. That. You obviously can't. Like, if you're advertising in the bridge, did you advertise it as in like the? We advertise it in the. However, however we do the the hearings. So you and can't notices. include all of that information yeah. there, but publicly we're saying it tonight. We yeah. can put it on the website. Yeah. You can have. Yeah, I think most of, the most effective ways. I think that all of the, where we found the most success was. Um, and, and, and it's wonderful because you are able to be much more nimble is all the online stuff. Um, whether that's email, um, we can push that out at any time. Um, <coughs> we can push that out really quickly. And then again, the social media. So I think those um, were certainly the, the, were very effective tools. And again, what is wonderful about that and why I, why I brought this all to you. So thank you for that feedback, Cynthia. I think it's good feedback as we can, um, we can get that out and amend that because nothing has gone out electronically. So um, I think that's good feedback. We'll include that language from the um, from the policy and move forward. So all of the electronic stuff will go out tomorrow. And you did say we're gonna consider, so it's really longer than, it, it's this four week period now because it's two weeks and then another two weeks of public comment. Right. But we're also gonna consider anything we've already gotten. So Absolutely, yes. really, we've gotten emails, we've, we've gotten things back from November. We're, I, I, I think we're, we're gonna expect more options as well. Yeah. Okay. Any other feedback? Seems really thorough. Great. Um, I don't know if tonight's the night, but you know I have not commented on this entire discussion to date in public, and the policy is really clear that the superintendent may have an opinion, and this one does. Okay. Um, you I'm know I to entertain it, and I guess maybe since I'm about to put it to paper and send it to the chair, I guess to follow the policy, it seems smarter to say in public before I do that. Um, you know the vision of this middle school has been Concord Middle School for the five years I've been diligently working to bring it to funding and design and construction with the vision of finally merging the two building model. It was like the last step of the vision was to clean the name part up. We did all the work to reconfigure a few years ago and put sixth and Peabody and seventh and eighth in Sanborn. Mr. Cameron relentlessly will not call it Peabody and Sanborn. He's changed my nomenclature so it's the grade six building and the grade seven eight building and all the logos with the Concord Middle School. All of that's been very intentional in the last six and seven years. And the culminating vision was a the Concord Middle School. And I just can't let go of that. I'm absolutely for Ellen Garrison and all that she's done. I, I'd love to talk about another way to honor that because we're all about that work and the anti-racist work and the promoting of the diverse population in the community. I just don't know that disrupting the vision of this long project with a long-term plan that's all through all of our documents, our school improvement plans and our strategic plans and 
it just I can't I've tried a lot over the last few months as this started to see if I could get myself there and I just can't so my um, the recommendation from me will be the Concord Middle School okay and you'll get that in writing I will that's great all right um, so next um, we could put something in the daily bulletin too under the now the daily bulletin Lori's bulletin under school committee news yeah. would be another place to just that yeah no there. that's in there okay great great um, all right uh, Lori I'm gonna turn the capital plan discussion yeah, over thanks. to you so <coughs> you, you saw I put a memo together and I very rarely ask you to honor me with sort of reading it out loud but I think for the public's sake and the um, other committees that I mentioned here I really would like the time to do that um, there is also a recommendation in here to readjust the CPS capital plan a pretty significant one but it feels like the background rationale behind that seems really important to say in public um, and I say this all really meaning to just tell a story it's no one's fault there's no blame there's no nothing we're just not synced and I just feel the name the desire the need to say that out loud and to talk through like where we are and where I hope we might get to. Um, so the memo is to share an overview of the recent discussions about the FI25 CPS capital plan, my questions and concerns, a revised proposal and a request for the future. Um, so during the development of the plan, the school administrative team crafted a plan aligned with the CPS capital process in existence for decades where the town manager designates $900,000 to the schools to manage facility needs. Using the same process, the proposed plan intentionally focused on overdue or safety related items because the FY24 capital request funded a facilities review that is currently underway at the three elementary schools in Ripley. Like plans before it, the requests included lesser cost items. This was especially true this year given the review that will likely bring new large cost items to the forefront since the buildings are now between 15 and 20 years old. The school, you know, this part, the school committee reviewed the plan on November 7th. The Concord Finance Committee discussed the plan on the 16th. Joint meeting was held between the Concord School Committee Select Board and Finance Committee on December 4th. Concerns about the plan were expressed at both meetings as well as other meetings that I attended in November and December. Concord School Committee formally approved the plan on December 19th. My questions and concerns. A patterns emerged regarding the CPS capital plan in 2022. The FY23 plan was ultimately re reworked late in the spring, completely after feedback over sustainability priorities questioned the proposed upgrades as not sustainably aggressive enough. In 23, the FY24 plan proposed significant upgrades to Ripley to allow for sustainable heating changes in the preschool classrooms. Given the concerns over cost, the entire plan was reworked in the spring eliminating that project and reducing the request to $495,000. We now find again ourselves questioning the FY25 plans. Concerns now are over how it will be financed, giving that borrow is not, borrowing is not appropriate. Prior to November, these questions or concerns had not been asked of us regardless of the project amounts and the requests. It's important to note that we absolutely agree that small amounts should not be borrowed. From 2019 to 2021, I served on the Capital Task Force the charge of the committee was to develop a process to discuss, and uh, Cynthia was there, other people were there too, I just, this is my story, <laughs> so to develop a process to discuss capital across the schools in town. The committee developed a process that was supported by the school committee, select board, and finance committee. That plan was intended to foster communication between the committees and clarify processes. My questions and concerns are the following. A conflict exists between sustainability priorities and the fiscal mindset. The schools have been told we are not doing enough sustain for sustainability. The schools have also been told we are spending too much on sustainability. There's new confusion over the capital thresholds and categories. The school operating budgets have always included all of the technology and school bus costs, which are very significant. The, bus, the budget also has managed ongoing repairs and proactive maintenance. Capital costs for significant repairs or replacements and preventative upgrades and improvements have been in the capital plan for the CPS buildings. It's unclear that now the expectation that there are very, it is unclear that the expectations between the town and schools are, are identified and we need to name those. We all agree that borrowing for small amounts is not best practice. Given the new feedback that borrowing is the only financing method for the CPS plan, we find ourselves with limited options given the late date. The capital task force plan and its current implementation are unclear. Having personally spent significant time developing and committing to that process, it seems important to discuss the process itself and clarify if we are using it or not. 
The $900,000 allocation allowed schools to address large cost projects over several years in lieu of significant requests for the entirety of each project. We will need clarity if we are working within particular amounts going forward, which were allowed us to defer and schedule items, or if we are now putting forth requests individually, which will be of larger amounts sometimes. My revised proposal for FY25, after much thought, I'm recommending revisions. With no appropriate funding source identified, I recommend delaying the smaller ticket items. This comes with significant concerns over deferment and the impact of that. However, it seems best both for purposes of collaboration and fiscal planning. The revised request is as follows. $200,000 to fund the improved uh, grounds feasibility study. We will have recommendations from that in the next few months and allow the Thoreau campus to start to recuperate. Funds to replace the Alcott fire alarm system at $96,000, which is a safety requirement. Funds to replace the 20-year-old dump truck of $150,000 for a total revised request of $446,000. Going forward, my request is the following. It seems very important that following the 2024 annual town meeting, Professional town and school leaders, along with representatives from the three boards, meet to address the many questions that have arisen and provide clear direction for how capital funding and sustainability goals will be addressed going forward. You, no one else has seen this yet. This had to come to all of you first. Um, you um, will send it out. I will send it. I'll clean up any typos and send it, but I wanted to be sure you, you will send it out to the groups that are intended to be CC'd yes. on that. So, uh, Lori, I want to thank you for that because uh, I do agree with many of your concerns. I, I have a couple of comments being sure. somebody who participated in the Capital Planning yeah. Task Force. Um, and I was frustrated by the boundaries of that task force and was, and somewhat with the outcome of it, as some other members of the committee were. Um, it was a sort of a flawed uh, makeup of the committee. As we've come to find out, we shouldn't have so many town employees sitting on a committee, especially when they're um, reporting into the town manager, it makes for a very odd construct for during votes. But anyway, that, I'll put that aside. But the one uh, thing was this is just for tier three planning. It has become very obvious that we need better um, uh, ideas about tier one and tier two planning, which has become this. Whatever those actually are. Which right, but is so also the, capital, right, the capital planning task force unfortunately didn't mm -hmm. weigh in with that kind of those guidelines. So I completely agree with you that we need to have a common language, a common structure, uh, especially when it, we're talking about the town of Concord capital planning, which needs to involve the schools in the town because we're all in the same town. So we're not separate entities. Um, and I know based on this report, um, we'll identify some needs or needs down the road. Um, the the real uh, concern, I think, for, for voters and the reason the task force was created is to have the big conversation about the big needs, um, which we still, I don't think, have had yet, honestly. Um, we're nibbling at the edges. Um, but I don't know what the uh, structure would be for such a discussion of tier one and tier two capital. Uh, I hate to say the word a task force or an advisory committee or what have you, but. Um, there needs to be some working group of some kind, I think, to start to create a, um, uh, a roadmap for how we're going to do this, especially if we're going to do it in FY26. Um, so I, I, I don't know if we have uh, you and the town manager so nibble at that and, and propose something to the boards, the school committee and the select board. Um, and obviously I do think the finance committee needs to be involved. Many towns have capital committees that go through tier one, tier two, and tier three, particularly tier one and tier two, since tier three is usually a, a big vote and a whole different conversation. So um, I, I do think we need to do something. There's no question in my mind, because it would keep getting, wasting time and, and uh, resources spinning on these things. And there's some big questions about how we're gonna fund all these things in the next 10 years, probably. Mm. Um, and we do want to maintain, you know, our schools, our three elementary schools, and keep them going for maybe more than 50 years. Um, uh, so I think especially with the report coming, I would like to begin something before next fall yeah. um, because that's too late. Yeah, agreed. Um, so I hate to say the word, you know, summer or yeah, yeah, late no, spring. I, 
I was thinking right after town is, meeting. Yeah. Right after <laughs> like town meeting, yeah, like May. Gavel drops on town meeting and this commences, was, which I think could be helpful because that's May. There's some, we still have some energy in us. Yeah. Right, it's just very busy, no. as, as yeah. I'm sure you're all aware. <laughs> My only so, real goal right now is to stop the spinning that I feel like we're all mm. right, and then, <laughs> circling each other and having a hard time. The one other comment I have regarding sustainability is, again, I think we really need to partner. Um, I don't think anybody would expect us to address sustainability in the schools out of an operating budget. Um, and we just have to establish priorities. And then I think we really need to decide who is responsible for those initiatives. Yeah. You know, um, We don't have a sustainability director in the schools. And I know Mr. Sims' time is, you know, he's, he's got a lot on his plate. And then what's the... I still don't think it's been clear. We have a, uh, a sustainability committee in Concord, but we have no liaisons. We we don't really participate. Um, so that just seems kind of feels kind of weird, to be honest. Um, so maybe we could work on that uh, charge or um, figure out a way for us to partner. Whereas we're, we always seem to be kind of at odds, and I don't understand that. So um, <laughs> if it's truly a Concord sustainability committee, we need to participate. I think. We used to, in the way back days, have a liaison. I think Wally was, um, but I, I, you know, that's just an idea. I think we need is to. Is it the Concord Sustainability Committee or the climate? Climate action is different than that, right? No, that I'm, or is that. Yeah. It's the same thing. It's yes, that. I'm group. sorry. Yes. Okay. okay sorry. And I guess CSA. my band aid to that, just to comment, is the District Sustainability Committee has representatives from almost all of those right. groups, we including right now the chairs of um, a couple of them. So right. we yeah. don't need them. We tried to stay connected, no, but I'm not, not wrong. Right. We haven't figured it all out. Connected, sure. but we, would, we don't commit in a public process. Yeah. And I think we time talking over each other all the time instead of the groups, you mean? Not we we don't we don't we currently don't participate in the Climate Action Advisory Board in any meaningful way. Right. So they talk about the schools. Probably, sometimes, frequently, maybe. I don't know. I don't usually go to their meetings because they, they conflict. So I'm not saying that we do do that. Just worth considering so that we're more on the same page. Yeah, there's more. There's lots to talk about. <laughs> yeah. I agree. Thank and with Cynthia, thank you for this memo. I think um, it has been really challenging, and I'm, I'm glad that the... And, it, and it's, really, it's really hard to put into words why it was so challenging, so I, I applaud your effort to do that, and I think... Um, even something that this memo alone can do what you like provide some groundwork for moving forward and figuring that out. And, and I agree. I think the timeline can't be the fall. Um, and I also don't know what it necessarily looks right. like, so we'll so, figure it out. And maybe we can have early discussions so that we're ready to actually start something in spring yeah. after town meeting. But, um, the hope was to just sort of name it mm -hmm. and so, then try to get to a reconciliation of FY25 and then separate out the longer and then just for logistical purposes we as a committee can revote your new recommend uh, we can vote and discuss your new recommended capital plan on the December, December January 23rd, 23rd meeting. Yes. and that will be in time for print for the warrant yes, so we can will. I know we can amend it but it's just again I like mm -hmm. yep yeah the um, reduced number would be helpful, I think. Right. All right. Any other comments? Yep. I did send you a request to see the results of the Thoreau study and then what your plans are. It's not out yet. It's still a work in progress. Okay. There's a forum with the neighborhood next week. Okay. Um, and after that, it'll start to take shape. So forum based on, like, what do you want to present? Early ideas that okay. the, uh, the firm has. They've been out on site a few times. They've seen some survey results that, frankly, I haven't even seen yet. Okay. Um, and they're starting to, you know, gather the, okay, here are the priorities, and then they're going to propose some ideas to it. And so when do you think that we might see something? Uh, Bob, when do you think? February? Well, the, the forum is the 17th. It's, it's when do you think they week. might have a report done? For us here? Um, I, I'll, I'll talk to them at the 17th. I mean, they're presenting a presentation. It's not necessarily a written format on the 17th. Um, and also part of the intent. I mean, so we've done a survey with community, staff, parents. Um, you know, we don't want to present, here it is. 
to the people on the forum. Okay. She's just asking feedback, the timeline. Well. No. So we want to kind of incorporate. The so are they going to synthesize feedback after the 17th and then yeah, do yes. a final yeah. report? Yes. So, I guess, so when do we expect the final report might be? It's in March. March, is, uh, March is probably realistic. Okay. The 17th is a public forum? We've invited the neighborhood, essentially. They've had a lot of um, feedback for mm -hmm. us over the years, so we tried to formalize that. We purposely left it at the neighborhood. You could all argue whether that was the right thing to do or not, but the, the neighbors have been very engaged with us for a long time, and we needed a more formal place to share ideas with them. Anyone's welcome, but we haven't published it Can broader you than that. Can you send the details out to the school committee? Yeah. We could yeah. sit in the back of the room. I don't want to participate. Yeah, no, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's uh, the 17th at 7 at the row. And the facilities report, that's due in March. The, the um, CPS facility study, the big study, is around March maybe? You might get that. That's the target date as well. Okay. Yeah. Target date. Okay. Yeah. We need to review it. We need yeah. to. Yeah. 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 And that's K to eight, or is that K to twelve? It's CPS. Four buildings. Yes. 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 Well, including no Ripley it's and K five and Ripley. Yeah, they don't only need mm -hmm. to look. Because you don't need to do the middle school. school. <laughs> oh right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Period, right. K five. And the bus depot is not owned by us, correct? It's not. Yeah. Just. Right. It's pretty new, so I'm not worried about it. <laughs> All right, and then Lori, I know I'm going to turn this back. Are, are any ever are we good with capital, everybody? Okay, Lori, I know you wanted just a placeholder to talk quickly about the CPS. Budget. Yeah, and you know I don't have a, rec a new recommended reduction or budget information for you on CPS, other than we continue to watch and monitor. In fact, we've you know trying to really watch the preschool and what that might mean next year. But in combination with those other needs that are moving and the fact that I just reduced. Uh, half a million dollars worth of capital needs it or four hundred thousand dollars worth of capital needs i right now i don't see us being able to go to guideline but, but again we are what a, a delta remains of eighty nine thousand is that seven thousand seven eight yeah, that was eighty seven or so okay. yeah so we're less four hundred thousand yeah. and it was interesting i talked I it's not I know yeah it's not apple two, two buckets but you know so i also to, to that extent, I, I this was interesting because the the finance committee has, um, you know, just like any committee in, in different years, done things differently. Um, so I asked uh, Mr. Patel, who's the chair, I said, you know, do, do you want to discuss, um, you know, moving forward with the guideline because sometimes in the past the finance committee, based on our budgets, has. Um, redefined their guideline or changed it or uh, so that, um, again, the, the I think the way we used to kind of talk about it before you uh, was, you know, you'd go to guideline, you'd go to town meeting at guideline, making sure that the FinCom's guideline matched um, our budget guideline. So Mr. Patel was talking about, he said, you know, we are not entertaining the thought of changing our guideline. We've come to to the town with our guideline, 3.26%. What we, there, he's like, I consider our next steps being to determine whether as a finance committee, we decide to support your warrant article for your additional 89,000. So again, other finance committees have done it differently where they've changed their guideline. Mr. Patel has said the way that he intends to move forward will be to maintain his guideline. And I actually, it, it, quite makes, makes sense intellectually yeah. to me. Um, I will maintain my guideline because this is what we believe is our best recommendation. However, we will continue as a body um, to synthesize your feedback and your the data that you guys come in and then we will ultimately, you know, in the later, um, decide whether to support your budget at so, town meeting. So they would take a vote at FinCon? They will eventually they take say, a vote. We want to take affirmative action on the yes. CPS budget. And so there is still okay. a chance we could go. Well, well, we, well, there'll be a chance that they might. So, like, so for example, if Lori comes in at three point three or two five, and they're at three point two six, they will have to eventually take an, a vote as to whether they support it. Which again is to vote affirmative yeah. action. Um, well, I guess with the, the region, that's it's, it's actually the same thing. They're going to go yes, in. Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, yes, 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 yes. We're yes. under, and they. Right. We're under, but our assessment brings us over. So oh, the it's assessment. very confusing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very confusing at the region. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that we all understood that because, again, the past, the practice has been inconsistent, and I, I thought it 
his practice was a good one. They look at it, they look at it without debt in the region, which is why there's a disparity. Without debt, yeah. Okay. All right. So I have a question for Kristen. We throw you a curveball, but not tonight. Um, is there a way to um, add up what we spend in K-8 or wherever you want to draw the line on literacy, curriculum, so curriculum and then literacy outside the classroom, so specialists, uh, you know, what we really spend and the, and the curriculums that we are using. Um, I don't know if that's really hard to do or not really hard to do. I have no idea. You mean materials and people? Yeah. Before we grade levels, K to eight, mm -hmm. K to twelve. Yeah, yeah. Is that like could we marry that with the literacy report we're bringing to you in February? Well, I was going to say because we're actually the, yeah no 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 in that's the great. throes of that discussion. Um, because what is the most recent one since? Is it twenty twenty one? See, I know that we have had one since West Ed Day. Or what no, 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 no. The literacy. When was the most recent one before? If we're going to do it in February, that's oh, it. brought to this committee. Yes. Oh, yeah, we're bringing you in February. Chris and I are actively working with the ELA specialists and um, reading specialists right now on some documentation. And so if you go through our report requests, you can see um, there are there's at least one, perhaps two. Right, that are the focused one posted on publicly is 2021. So that's fine. Yeah, if we're yeah, yeah, do yeah. It in no, it's scheduled right after the February break. So, so yeah. Want, and then just what staffing and materials. Correct. And, and the what curriculums. Yes. Right. And then what the names of the curriculums are, and then what, uh, if you can figure out what the change is over FY24 and the FY25 budget, something like that. I mean, I just want to show that, you know, they always said this is our document and what we're investing in one of the most mm -hmm. important things. I think it's great. In, yeah, so, yep. You know, literacy in Concord is kind of a big deal. Not that math isn't important. Thanks. Okay. All right, and then um, in closing, um, I would like to entertain a motion to approve the quarterly transfers um, at the Concord Public Schools for Q2, two, two, <laughs> So moved. Second. <laughs> I don't like oh, anyone a second? You're all, you're all for it. Let, let's have Cynthia move it and okay. I'll second it. Okay. Great. <laughs> Um, and all in favor. Aye. 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 All right. With that, I will adjourn. Thank you all. Be safe.